Yeah, I mean, you have to wonder if, you know, if Ballistics did kind of slip on that hammer, can they afford to let that happen again? I don't think so. I think knocking out Towers of Doom, like you say, very smart from Gen.G. I think it's actually very intelligent to pick a map like that where you're not super confident on it because we know the strength of first pick, you know, especially to these teams like Gen.G with such confidence in the draft. I think picking your weaker maps and having that second pick at the same time is actually quite nice. But getting a win on that is even better. And I think moving on to the more comfortable Volskaya, we have to, like, definitely see Ballistics be very tight in the draft phase or this could be, you know, a very dangerous dangerous series. Yeah, we have the draft here on Valskaya Foundry ready though, as we're gonna get it kicked off. But I think that's a great point you bring up, Snitch. It's one of those like almost stopping the bleeding techniques by picking that weaker map and giving up that first pick. And then when you end up winning it, you're just like, wait a minute here. You have so much going for your favor through the rest of the series. If momentum is very much going to be a concern, but Ballistics start things off with this Phoenix ban and a Genji response by Gen G. I also can't really help myself, but the entire time I'm waiting for some kind of rich special to come through and uh, set a new meta again, as we've seen at the mid-season brawl when he started to play Hammer. Oh, I'm yeah. quite sure if we're actually going to get that. We got reset with the Nazebo, but... Yeah, yeah, true. But we'll That's see if they got something else. Not quite as dominant as we had with Rich's Hammer pick, but it's definitely a bit of a touch there. When it comes to the bans, though, we are looking currently, at least on the first rotation, at the exact same pattern that we had in game number one. Phoenix and Genji, I mean, Genji has been an absolute staple in the bans, but this time it's more about Mayev, and we've been highlighting her strength on this battleground quite a lot in previous series, and it feels that if you give that over to Genji, they are just going to rip you apart in every single team fight. Mayev has been such a curious pick, I feel like, for me throughout this tournament because it seems like she has only been willing to be displayed up into the, in the first rotation of bands, or it feels like she's willing to kind of make it a little bit later into the draft, in, or sometimes even neglected completely. But it's not going to be an aggressive kind of pick up here, and I'm glad that we do not see the full backline kind of bands that we got out of game number one. Ballistics will commit to the Decker Kane. What do Gen.G want here? For me, one of the heroes that I really want to see again is Urel, to be honest. Genji played her a lot, and uh, we saw them specifically with the Nubarak Urel combo. But I feel even outside of the pairing with the Nubarak, relying on Urel again would be absolutely great for them here. They have definitely been the team at the Eastern Clash so far that had the biggest impact with her. Other teams, I feel, still were a little bit shaky in the way that she can provide peel for the backline. We've seen that on Infernal Shrines a few times, but in Genji's hands, she was always a staple. So I would absolutely love for them to rely on the hero for the offlane again. So it's just out of curiosity, when you see the Raynor Malfurion commitment, uh, I, I guess to my brain, that's not anything like the Decker Kane and the Raynor. They both have that very slow kind of play style and how they function, but uh, one of these is not like the other, and the fact that Malfurion is a major step back. It's committing to those two too early on, do you feel like that? sets too much commitment to a slow play style or there is enough tools still remaining into the draft to, again, move a different direction? I think if the map wasn't Volskaya, I would agree. You know, the okay. Malfurion could be troubling. But I think on a map like Volskaya, where you, the focus is so much on that first objective, I think having the Malfurion to match the sustain of Decker Kane is very, very important. It's more of to Genji, I think, from this opening to build a stronger draft outside of this Malfurion to make sure they win that first objective. Because obviously, if the map starts opening up against them, the Malfurion is very, can be very weak with so much, you know, space around them for Ballistics to find engages, especially with this Hanzo, you know, finding solid arrows, which you've seen SC doing all tournament, can be very dangerous as Malfurion if the map is too open. So I think Genji are basically looking to take this Malfurion, win the first objective, open the map in their favor, and kind of control the game that way. I'm already loving the way that this has now shifted. I mean, we talked about Ural a bit more on Genji's side because it's a hero that they mainly played more so than any other Korean team. But Ballistics now also prioritizing her way higher, taking her, which forces Genji into an Anubarak ban since they don't want to face that combo that they brought into the tournament. And then Ballistics reacting with just focusing on bans against the solo laners here. Leoric by no means a bad pick here, but definitely off we have the priority on Blaze in all of those drafts on Volka Volskaya so far. And with Urel, my question is just simply, who's going to be the frontliner that they choose to, em to emphasize that? And they go for an ETC comp with Chromie. I very much like this Chromie pick. Yeah. I think this was Genji's final ace in the hole, and I think it's very smart Ballistics to adapt and take it. I think the Leoric's being picked here mainly to just control this Ero. A little bit of a positive matchup for Leoric playing against her. Control that bot lane, try and prevent her from getting any space on this first point, which, as I stress, Genji are very much looking to win. So keeping this Ero kind of controlled in the bot lane, I think, is very important, and the Leoric pick represents that. I also really like the combo. Lo like, we criticized ETC quite a bit for how easy he can, easily he can be blown up, but in this setup, I really like the pick a lot because, as as we highlighted before, he oftentimes is used to create space for the backline and to keep them safe. And you have now Hanzo and especially Chromie to take care of. Urel, 
fulfilling exactly the same role here in those fights and the sustain that the two of them bring, especially with Urel adding the armor to ETC's lower hit point pool, is fantastic for that setup. So in this particular combo, I'm actually liking it a lot. Good control, keeping Chromie safe and allowing her to get the damage in from afar. I really love the composition as well from Ballistics. I'm going to say minus the ETC. I'm still a little bit torn on whether or not I like that peel. I know that has been the Eastern kind of clash approach and definitely has been the Eastern scenes go to in these type of circumstances. But I just wonder, is it going to have the tools necessary? Because as I, I kind of highlighted, I was afraid, you know, are they committing a little bit too much to the slow? I feel like the minute that the Leoric was picked up on the other side with that denial in the Chromie, I go, they are going too slow into the team fights, and there is a ability to be able to get that punishment, but I, I don't know if ETC is going to be the enabler necessary to really force the hand on the opponent's side. Now, personally, I'm still a big fan of having Muradin in that role over ETC, and Muradin was still open, but they've shown such a priority on ETC that, at least in the combo with Urel, I like the ETC pick more than what we've seen before. Yeah. And also what I kind of enjoy is he has the peel power for Chromie. So Mur uh, Muradin would be a little bit more sustainable at the front. You have the good engage with the good uh, Storm Bolt after a jump. But at least in this setup, I'm not minding the ETC as much as we did in previous series. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's one of those, it's a little bit better, but I still yeah. look at it and go, is that going to be enough? Because ETC has been made, uh, you know, quickly into beef for a lot of this tournament. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm just one of those Western teams, but I would have really preferred to see a Joanna here. I think they're trying to play the ETC in the same role, but I think this kind of puts a timer on Ballistic's comp. I think they need to find that poke with Chromie. Yeah. They need to get that poke with Hanzo before this ETC dies, because I think, you know, Genji has such strong pressure on this front line that I think the ETC is going to ch get chipped down more and more and more, and I think we're going to need to look at STE to find those combos and secure those kills before it's too late. I completely agree, and with how long of a sustained fight that Genji has, there's a lot of pressure that's going Going to be applied to Hooligan, but we'll figure out if he has what it takes here on the ETC as we are going to get into game two on Volskaya Foundry. With a 1-0 game advantage from the winner's bracket, Gen G has now the 2-0 lead over Ballistics in the grand finally at the East End Clash. And we see them to the left of Volskaya, Foundry with Saka on Malfury and reset on Junkrat. Rich this time on Reyna, another auto attacker for him. Kyocha with Leoric on that off lane and Tist again on Burden. And here are four Ballistics trying to make that Eastern Clash magic. We got Decker Kane played by Magi, SDE on the Chromie, Yurel played by Jung Ha, Hooligan on ETC, and SC on Hanzo. We've seen in previous games when uh, Gen.G played Chromie how strong she can be on the battleground here and how powerful she can be in particular against the frontline heroes and shut them down early. The question still remaining is oh, of course how impactful is SDE going to be on that hero? Can he land those skill shots and just chip away at that frontline that we see from Gen.G before we are having Muradin engage with a heavy jump onto ATC because you mentioned it perfectly right earlier. ETC just suffers from that lower hit point pool, and with all that frontline pressure, there's always the chance that he gets taken out. Yeah, he used to be the go-to sustained teamfight-oriented warrior. Just through the long run, you know, some of the nerfs kind of coming on the line, and some of the impact to Johanna's relevance within the meta, it just feels like she is very much that kind of standout. But I do... I'm a little bit torn because I think, uh, you know, Snitch even highlighted it the best in the fact that it's like, it's weird on the fact that it's not always on Hooligan's shoulders because if SDE can just like raw snipe something properly, then Hooligan has a lot more breathing room and area uh, that he can make things happen. And so I, I don't know if I look at this as much as Hooligan, you have to play safe or if I go SDE, you need to play out of your mind this round. I mean, talking about uh, playing out of your mind, we have timely surprise taken on level four here. An adjustment already. So on level one, the mounting sands taken immediately by Chromie. Definitely, we have seen a lot of different Chromie builds in this tournament, actually. Dragon's Breath as a huge focus, and now this adjustment from Ballistics as we're seeing the fight over oh the healing bus. And oh my god, Deckard Kane with a fantastic setup. The kill against Tist. Can they secure a second against Rich? They get the trap actually under reset, and then they throw the Chromie damage down. Two kills for nothing here. Ballistics with a great invade there over the support camp and gaining now a lot of control here on the battleground. And that is the timer and questions that we had at hand. And I feel like SDE is up to answer the call. My goodness, <laughs> the damage there over that skirmish. 
It definitely looks like it. He wants to go for the fast stacking here at this point with the Mountain Sands on level one. And he currently looks at 19 stacks after this engage. Not too shabby for two minutes into the game. Looking good there. The timely surprise. Of no Wraith Walk. He's going to get ganked. Kyoto has this. Uh, he has a uh, well, has the support camp. That was a huge misstep there. Wraith Walk up in about four seconds. He's going to be just in range, but without the Drain Hope, I don't think he can survive. I mean, even if he survives. Oh my. I mean, even with that move and him surviving, to be quite frank, the main thing that he wanted to get out of this is bait out the healing pulse. Yeah. And that's exactly what they achieved there. M mission accomplished for Ballistics and something that is absolutely a problem if SDE is making a rain the same way he was over that support camp earlier. We'll find out as we are now 10 seconds away from control point A. A pretty big momentum or at least positional advantage, at least for now, for ballistics. And as Gen G is still concerned there with the turret. SDE, I mean, look at it. Chromie again of going full ADRD style um. here with a chrono sickness on level 7 after the earlier level 4 here. The timely surprise with the cooldown resets when the time traps are triggered. Now we have the chrono sickness, more cooldown reduction here as well and the additional slow. It's all about control at this point, from Ballistic's point of view. And this is really difficult for Genji to engage on. And that actually makes ETC so much safer and eliminates one of those weaknesses it that does. we highlighted earlier. It does, as long as the traps are going to be very effective here. Leo has spent his rotation down to bottom to get a little bit of clear while Genji is still accumulating. Quite a bit of that percentage now going to be able to anchor off and deny a lot of experience down below. This means Ballistics need to do something here over this control point. And Chromie sitting at 30 stacks already. With a level 1 talent with the Mounting Sands, he is really getting those stacks in right now. Great job by SE so far, but of course we're still talking about the first objective. And at this point, Gen G is holding the advantage. They hold the point and they already have a great position here, but Ballistics is starting to push forward. They need to make something happen without the Auric there, and they get the damage in onto Rich. And again, SDE ends up hitting the skill shots and getting the pickoff here. They need to zone off if they're going to get some of this Reset. percentage back. Reset, it will be able to make it past that gate before the hammer comes in. Turret's going to be thrown down, and now Ballistics with the first point of control. I am loving what I'm seeing there. Ballistics, after losing game number one, a map where they thought, okay, we have the upper hand here, they come out on Volskaya, absolutely not impressed by what Genji did so far. And they're just flat out stating, we are here to win this. We are not trying to just play around with you, boys. And they're looking great. Three kills against zero, great adjustments on Chromie to make up for some of the weaknesses that they perceived at their own front line. And they're looking at a fantastic setup for the first objective now. I, I agree with you, and it's so much so that now that we've seen so many traps be high impact, hold up, look at that flank there from Kyocha. Yeah. Move again, maybe in a bad spot. Penetrating round does come through. No power slide commitment yet, as Kyocha does end up landing that drain hope. He hits another trap, Chromie damage comes through. Wraith Walk is there, and he will be able to escape, but absolutely chunked on that retreat. And the entire time... SDE. He got flipped over by the concussion mine. He's not going to be able to make it out this time. And that is a kill now. Gen G able to get that kill and should be able to snowball this control point here as they still have 93% into their favor. Eliminating Chromie was exactly what they needed here. Gen G again finding the one opportunity that they needed. The storm ball comes in. Tist once again setting it up to take Magi down. Help is on the way, and they can barely keep Deckard Kane alive here. The Punisher, the Protector, has been taken, though. The route will be dodged there by SE, but if that had landed, that would have been one dead SE. Concussion mine number two, launched there by Reset, constantly displacing the members of Ballistics. But now, the focus is going to be here to the mid front wall. Or Genji here with the Protector. We'll see where they want to make the rotation here afterwards. The showing a bit of interest towards bottom. The kill against Chromie was actually at the perfect time for Genji because it was just about to hit the level 8, so to say the level 10 for Chromie. And we have the attempt to exploit the lack of a cleanse on the other side. If that comes through as they're still fighting for the Protector, that could have been used to set up a potential kill here again. But right now, Ballistics in a defensive position as Genji is pushing through that mid lane. Which also means that the top lane is not going to be prepped by Gen G for the second objective, though. It, yeah, it's not going to be prepped as well, but with the 10 spike, they can pre prep it, is I feel like the thought process yeah, here, true. right? It's such a big yeah. window that it's like, well, it really doesn't matter how good our protector is because you cannot handle our heroics here. 
But one thing I, that I think that we have to be keeping our eyes on with how effectful, that, how impactful, not only with the kind of talent choices SDE has been on that Chromie time traps, uh, and, and how many Gen.G has actually hit over that fight, I want to bring to light that I feel like Sake needs to just be given a little bit of defense, somebody stand around him a little bit longer, because he's one of the best to be able to get the reveal with that Moonfire onto those traps. Just give him a little bit of time, throw out a couple rotations of very common areas, and suddenly it won't be as you know high-risk decisions if Gen.G wants to try and move forward. Even with the lead that we have for Gen.G, the one thing that I'm really looking for is uh, how is Chromie going to run into the mid and late game? Because we highlighted how this build and the play of SD has allowed him to get a significant amount of stacks in the early game. And right now he's sitting at 42. So if he can keep that up, with the same pace, and he is going to become an absolute menace towards that late game. And this is definitely something that might be a bit of a linchpin in the plans of Gen.G towards the later stages of this match. Do we think we're going to get the mosh pit? Or do we think we're going to get the stage dive? I feel like the stage dive might be an answer if they're worried about that really late game split pressure. But more, I would like the I would mosh like pit more than either yeah. one of those. The setup with the stay a while and listen combos, you know, just looking for the temporal loop. And then whenever most people respond to that, they kind of funnel in and then see that power slide through. But so far, you know, Hooligan hasn't pulled the trigger, at least not quite yet. I mean, even for rotations later on, a one-man mosh pit is nothing to frown upon if you can get that kill. And with setting yourself up for the chromie damage, it's definitely something you can pull off. Don't forget the Hanzo arrow as well. If that's being used as a setup, as a follow-up, that can definitely do a lot of work here. Definitely. Also, I can already hear Trix love from here. Bye bye on level 13. I'm, yeah, never I'm, gonna hear the end of, I'm never going to hear the end of it. Yeah, I'm a little sad. I'm not going to lie here. Bye bye will allow the easy escape, though. Hold on. Somebody who's going to need that escape maybe Zhang Ha. Getting a full drain hope. Taking a couple heals and pots there from Magi. Genji is going to be rounding the 13 talents here inevitably before control point B is online, meaning that Ballistics needs to find a situation where they make a macro decision or at least force a team fight here before that window happens. And with we see the ETC down below, I feel like that says it's a stage dive play right now or it's very much going to be the mosh pit slow play and we're looking for a fight maybe at you know, 16 into 16 and I feel like Ballistics is a little bit optimistic if they think that's going to happen. Also, when we're talking about optimism, that last attempt here to go for Muradin was also maybe a little bit faster on the trigger button here. No chance to even remotely take Muradin down in this case. We're talking about level 13 talents again though, in 20 seconds until we're having the control point activate. That gives Ballistics a bit more time to try and get the experience here. But Gen G should still get the better start into it. I mean, you're frowning a little bit upon uh, the uh, bye-bye choice, but to be quite honest with you, with displacements coming in, uh, also Leori going straight for the Entomb here, if he can set that up, bye-bye can definitely put you to safety. Personally, we still prefer them to go into the stasis, but it's at least a choice that you can make good arguments for. We just see a full rotation for four members of Ballistics to bottom lane here, knowing that they're still needing the 13 talents here. They're not going to gain too much, though, as Kyocha one of the best defenders in these type of situations, not to threaten in any way, shape, or form. But because Ballistics hasn't made the rotation up, it, I mean, we're going to see a 99% kind of all in. The support camp is now actually going to be invaded here, picked up by Tisk. Well, again, goes in a bit late, drops the healing pulse immediately. Oh, one of them is being dropped here. They still hold on to one more. 13 talents in the hands now of Ballistics as they are starting to make the rotation towards the top lane. Leoric still holding bottom for an additional wave, so that would allow Ballistics to take the control. I think Gen.G maybe would have liked a little bit more percentage in this type of situation for Leoric to display himself on bottom, but eventually, likely, will make the transition up. If not, Junkrat should join with Leo for a double split pressure opportunity in that bottom lane. We'll see what they end up wanting to do here as they still are holding off Ballistics from gaining anything. The conveyor belt escape for Tiss is going to be there. Knockback is there from Hooligan. No power slide pulled yet. And Leoric still at the bot lane the entire time. That's a huge amount of pressure on the bottom fort. And also it helps, of course, with the third objective already. Eliminating the fountain there is huge. And denying the experience to Ballistic shows also level 14, nearly 15 against 13. Gen G has really set themselves up for an early level 16. If they get this protector, Ballistics is going to be in a huge amount of trouble. Yeah, it's going to be a terrible position for them to be in. Tisto had to end up burning that Dwarf Toss to get out of there. SDE lands. Nice little bit of sandblast on to reset. Everybody has made their way here up towards the top lane. And look at the Rip Tire already set out. Is that going to be committed to? We'll find out. 
Yeah, a lot game. of damage there on to SC. Yeah. He <laughs> healed up the hood in a second. Check out Kane definitely coming through for his voice here. Jong Ha entering the point as they are trying Temporal. to invade again. And in the back line, reset barely surviving. Sake helping out massively with that. The Stale and Wyland get listen. They're starting to move in here, but Mog is so low and he falls first. Deckard Kane is down. Can oh. they take this? They set him up and they take the dwarf apart. Yeah, they do a good job there. Able to get the pick off there for a moment. A little bit of anti synergy as Hooligan's knockback actually moved from the dwarf toss uh, away from SDE's damage, but they hold their own there. Leo will secure the rest of that uh, protector. And now Gen G have a two man protector for themselves. They are going to be rounding the 16 talents here significantly before Ballistics. And the window that you were talking about, the fear you kind of had before, yeah. it's not exactly the circumstance, but it is, it's pretty darn close here. Yeah, with this, they should, act, first of all, they should get the 40 and then the level 16 and then even snowball it further. But without Murad in there, we are currently seeing Ballistics at least shelling away against the Protector, trying to drop the HP as fast as they can. It could be worse. It definitely could be. But now there's level 16, and it just depends on how much can Genji now do with that. Junkrat is still at the bottom. Murder on the way. Very little value out of the Protector so far for Genji. But once they get the five-man unit, I feel like they're going to be able to make a lot happen here. The question is, do they go for the key front wall or instead another fort down below? As we see the trap actually going to get hit there. SE trying to make his way oh. out. We see the Ardent Defender, but that's just going to be body blocked to death. And Jung Ha with no, uh, uh, excuse me, mana available. It is just a matter of time here until his fate is sealed. Two members down. Gen G still 20 seconds remaining here on the Protector, and they make their way by. And this is one of those moments where Ballistics had actually a really good defense going for them, but then losing one and then more or less suiciding the second as Urel jumps in for an attempt at saving it makes it just worse because now the second fort falls, and this is full map control for Gen G. Now on the bright side, Ballistics is half a level behind from level 16. So they can get that level and they should be able to force another fight here. But they really need to get something done. We have 69 stacks on the side of Chromie by now. So that's at least increasing the damage there. But they need to get kills after level 16 and really need to get something going here. Because Genji is currently establishing full map control. And that last skirmish wasn't really necessarily an error force, I feel like, by Gen.G. It was a bit more panic from the members of Ballistics. Yeah. With Magi on that sale while and listen, I feel like SDE had a pretty clever attempt uh, trying to get the Temporal Loop one shot on to reset. It sent him down to about 5% of his maximum HP, but once Magi went in for the follow-up, he heavily neglected his own positioning. Maybe a conveyor belt use into a flank with that would have been a bit easier, but either way, you know, if Magi finds a way to kind of restrain his positioning and still have a impactful stay a while and listen, Maybe Ballistics have a better late game team fight than we're giving them credit, especially with SDE just, you know, it's pretty much lining them up. It's open season whenever you got that stay a while as Chromie. Yeah, also the Quantum Overdrive on Chromie is something that they're trying to use out to confirm these kills and to set this up. Once again, the Entomb being used here, but doesn't find the value. It was well done by Ballistics. 16 talents are there. Ural is on the way, but Hooligan is already low. And Kyojo was thinking about it, but they're moving away from this position, at least for now. Genji is happy to stall this out and get level 20 talents. They're playing the safe game here. They know, of course, that if they have the 2 lead in the series already, if they play this safe and they move towards level 20, they have a really good shot of setting themselves ahead so far that it's just match point after match point from here on out. And Ballistics, they need to be aggressive. They need to be the ones to force a play here, and that's what they're trying to do down here. Yeah, Leoric is actually getting a huge collapse, though. Nine seconds on the Entomb if they would like to try and force that. Gonna be a bit more patient there, not getting the all-in. And as you said, it, I mean, understandably so. There is no reason for Genji to really need to force anything. Yeah. All the responsibility of that is on the shoulders of Ballistics. And the level 20 for Genji just terrifies me. I mean, buried, buried alive, alive actually makes me like just cry on the inside anytime <laughs> I see it. <laughs> yeah. It is such a, hey, do you enjoy playing Heroes of the Storm? How do you feel not playing Heroes of the Storm? Because that is what that button does. Now, then again, when we have a level 18 coming in, uh, considering Chromie's build, the Endoral Anomaly that we pretty much expect here at this point should really give her a massive, massive power spike when it comes to zone control. So if they somehow can close that experience gap at least a little bit, um, Chromie might be the difference. Zheng Ha, kind of in an island after that leap. No Arden Defender It's going to be used, but that's last second then. Hooligan getting flipped over with that concussion mine. But you have to admire how he juked out Jong Ha. I mean, that little tick to the side and the immediate move into the middle, but of course a massive, massive cooldown burn now on URL. That is a 
major misstep for the yeah. weight in this type of situation within this series. You know, uh, almost as much as the APOC kind of conundrum with the Void Prison we had in the last series here. It's going to lead to Genji getting that 20 spike, getting the Protector pretty much for free, knowing that there's no Arden Defender. That is a major cooldown setback. Here's and the thing, though. Genji's prepping bot lane. With the Andoral Anomaly that we're already seeing for Chromie and her trying to set up the bot lane, they have an honest chance at defending. The level 20 is though what it comes down to, but if they can slow this down and really just get that protector into trap after trap, they have a chance of slowing this down. And if you defend this, then you are back in the game. You might lose your key, but if you can hold on to that core, you have a chance to force a fight later on. Chromie still keeps stacking. The Andoral Anomaly is great for her with the time dread build that we've seen. It's all about the defense. That and maybe if Sake, you know, kind of has his uh, time trap sniffer on this time, you know, able to hit the moon fires and be able to buy a bit yeah. of room there. I do think that is one of the areas that we can see Gen G respond to this build from Ballistics, but there hasn't been too much focus into it. And without, you know, getting to the keep front wall itself, the predictability of those traps is going to be very, very limited. Jung Ha securing as much experience as he can before he has to retreat and deal with. The Punisher, or Protector, excuse me, here yeah. from Gen G. And they don't have 20. Yeah, and now we're going to see it march here. Looking Ugh. to break the base up on two ballistics. Time trap number one. That's There's a rotation. Rough. And they get at least the stacks for Chromie, but is it going to be enough? Here comes the Protector. They're trying to end the game here. Gen G, that is. Level 19, nearly 24 ballistics, but it is not there yet. Can the mosh pit be found? The arrow on Hanzo. Here comes the Buried Alive, and Deckard is moving out of it. So far, they're staying alive here. End up getting the time trap, which really ends up survive or keeping him alive. Kyocho with the Wraith while getting the debuff through with that Stormbolt uh -oh. landing, though. SDE is going to drop there. No ability to say bye-bye to that one. Magi used the stay a while and listed, but not enough patience being displayed. Protector now moving on to the core. And that's the one you couldn't lose here. Once again, they're trying for the defense. The Protector is already losing hit point, but he's not the only one. The Dragon. core is dropping at this point. Here comes the kill against the Loric. Is that going to be enough? They're trying to go for the second here. In the back line, Rich is low, and we're seeing Jonga jumping indeed. The core holds for now, but Urel falls, and so does Deckard Kane. Hanzo explodes as Gen G is moving in for another victory. Gen G taking the adaptation of the draft there, even with the clever Chromie pick of Ballistics. But they respond throughout minutes one up until 19 here and take a lead in this series, three to zero. Now one game away from earning the only title they do not have for themselves, an Eastern Clash champion. And so far, it's just been another day in the office for them. It does very much feel yeah. like it there, Snitch. I mean, you know, we highlighted earlier with this Malfurion early pick, Genji had to take this first point. It was so important and reset the ultimate MVP, finds the concussion mine on SDE right before level 8, right before that Chromie gets temporal loop and blows up the game. Genji needed these walls alive to keep that Malfurion safe. He doesn't have the Ice Block anymore. His danger is getting dove or, you know, they're finding a good arrow, but they just couldn't do it. You know, Genji had so much of the map available and they just always had an experienced lead. Ballistics were always fighting from behind and Genji just played the fights flawlessly from then on out. It's, it's so weird because you look at the game and on the one hand you have to really think, okay, how amazing is this Genji lineup? They're making it happen every time. You're always talking about what could Ballistics do to come back into this. And then Genji looks at it and says, like, you know what? We know that Tyrion is just going to shut it down. And all of a sudden, all these opportunities are just gone. They're playing so well. But then you look at Ballistics, and it's just like that one, those 10 seconds that you need to hold that core, that one kill, that one escape, but it just doesn't happen for them. Even though I do feel like, well, I agree, everybody's been saying that here. It's just this close for Ballistics. We said the same thing against Blossom in games one and two, and they managed to hold their own. They kept the strength in. They had the mental strength to be able to turn it around. It is a different opponent. You know, four seed out of Korea is definitely not the world champions of Gen G, but it may be something that we can, again, get that kind of magic from Hooligan and friends here at the Eastern Clash and hold through. But it does feel like... Uh, with the Towers of Doom play and then the high impact Vol Sky of there, it feels like it's been it's going to be difficult for Blizzard. And then also, the one thing that I still have to call out here since we just had that, and I know that my boy is watching at home, uh, at this point, Bye Bye has a 0% win rate. I mean, just, I don't know. Just, just for the record. I do like the, the adaptations SDE is making in his build. The early time trap, yeah. very, very important. I do think Ballistics are doing the right things and they're making the right choices, but it's just not enough against this behemoth. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's just not enough to be able to deal with it here. But actually, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go to a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we have the conclusion here of the grand finals of your Eastern Clash between Gen G and Ballistics.
우린 증오의 굴레에 갇혔다. 어제의 아군도 오늘은 적이 된다. 우린 이 세계를 나눠 가진 대가를 치렀고 그렇게 강해지는 법을 잊었다. 대영유지! 정군 전진! 로데론을 되찾자! 국왕, 대족장을 포위했네. 계속 쏴라! 
Gen.G find that themselves one game away from claiming a, themselves undefeated and an Eastern Clash champion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dreadnought up with here at the desk is going to be Kaldor and Snitch here with me. Boys, I don't even know what to say at this point for Ballistics. It feels like they went through such a tough, you know, kind of trial uh, in the fact that they have now, again, this is their third series on the day. We talk about, you know, the kind of atmosphere adjustments that they can have when it comes to land, but it does feel like this is very much the breaking point up against the beast known as Gen G. I mean, they pull it off once, they have to pull it off again. The reverse sweep here, definitely a potential, but even just winning a map would already go like so far here at this point if they can pull that one off. And they're close. In both of those games, they had their chances, but it just feels that whenever you think there's an opportunity, Gen G is going to shut you down and they are playing this amazingly well. You talked about the kill against Chromie that was set up on the last map, just as it seemed, okay, they can make the play for the Protector through the time loop, and then Gen.G just happens, and they're just saying like, nah, not gonna happen today. Yeah, I mean, it's so tough to be Ballistics here. Game one, you know, you let Rich get that hammer as a last pick. It's, you know, an unfortunate kind of draft error. There's only so much to be done. Game two, I think they had all the right pieces, and then it just comes down to execution, and Gen.G are just somehow that level above, again. Yeah, I feel it's 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 insane the fact that they you know have found themselves in this position because when we talk about international tournaments you know outside of the performance that you guys had at the Western Clash there Team Dignitas we have only had way back the Spring Global Championship that we can ever claim anybody was able to claim an undefeated record through it here so it's surprising and it's amazing that we are having again that Dignitas of the West and possibly the Gen G going undefeated here in the East and what that is going to mean as we move through towards BlizzCon. But Ballistics has to find a way to be able to dig dip deep here. As we, you know, I'm trying to think about Battlegrounds, if there's anything there. We already highlighted the Towers of Doom possible flaw. That's one of the problems when you study Gen G. Their map record is almost always 100%, no matter what draft position they're in. As we do see those roll through Gen G, though, going down the line of their favorites there outside of the Towers of Doom outlier and going to Infernal Shrines. Infernal Shrines, I mean, Again, for me personally, it really, there's two things that it comes down to for me, to Ballistics. First of all, there are a couple of weaknesses that they have shown in the draft where it would make sense for them to uh, maybe be a little bit cleaner. You talked about Hammer being picked up earlier. We question sometimes the choice on ETC. And outside of that, I really feel it's just execution. Yeah. If they can get a little bit better on the execution level and uh, just secure that one kill that they need, play a little bit safer when they're under pressure, I think then they have a really good opportunity to turn this around. But it's just so difficult when your opponent forces you into these mistakes all the time. It's not they make them on their own, it's just the pressure that Gen.G is able to build up from minute one. Yeah, I mean, we're at tournament point here. You know, this is where maybe you start to get a little bit adventurous, but we're looking at Infernal Shrines. This is not a battleground where you can get super creative. The craziest thing we've seen in the tournament so far is a Kel'thas. And I'm not sure that's going to be the answer Ballistics need to take a map from Gen.G. I very much agree with you. It, it, it does seem like this has got to be that moment where they get that wild card. But yeah, as outside of the Kel'thas, you know, we don't really see anything major. Maybe a Cho Gaul uh, is something you might be able to rely on. <laughs> the Stitch just gives it the stank eye. I mean, the ignore on my point is even is a little bit disturbing here. Oh yeah, that's good. That's a good call. We've seen the Nazebo, but you know, we're talking about shrines here. There are minions everywhere. Can you really play this spider build and get these full value spiders against single target heroes when you, you know, you've got these little skull skeletons, skeletons running around, like catching your spiders? It just doesn't feel like that, you know, that sleeper Nazebo pick we've seen a few times is really going to